of the Blythe Tapes, and I'm joined today by a best-selling and acclaimed author who's been described as funny and warm and poignant and warm-hearted, immensely readable and sharply observed. Uh, she is uh, somebody who started a career in journalism at a, a very young age and has maintained that alongside uh, being a best-selling novelist, uh, writer for adults and for young people as well. It is the very versatile and popular and gifted Fiona Gibson. Fiona, hello. Welcome to... Hello. Thanks. Hi there, Daniel. Thanks a lot for asking me. Hi. Oh, it's lovely to, to see you. And um, so what... I mean, with a lot of these people that I've been interviewing, they've, they've all had very kind of broad careers, and it's very hard to know sort of where where to start. But um, let's um, let's talk about your your sort of um, entry into journalism at such a young age. I mean, what was that like starting out at the age of seventeen, uh, working uh, working on something like, like Jackie, which has such a a great sort of pedigree? Um, it, it was my kind of dream. Um, I was obsessed with magazines as a teenage girl, absolutely loved them. I had a very kind of rural childhood in a little village in West Yorkshire. And to me, Jackie was the kind of epitome of glamour. I had no idea it was put together in a quite a dusty office in Dundee. You know, I imagine the staff were all running down the King's Road in their kind of 70s hot pants. Um, but they were actually running around Dundee in the 70s hot pants. Um, so I'd applied, actually, I'd, I'd applied to art school because I also loved art and I didn't get in, which was no surprise looking back because my portfolio was pretty rubbish. It was schoolwork, you know, kind of um, Scottish higher art standard. Um, but I was really gutted. And um, what I'd been doing was pinging off the odd cartoon and little drawings and jokes to comics and keeping a bit of a kind of contact going with DC Thompson, the publisher of Jackie, and also Dandy and uh, Bino. Um, and I, I was all lost really when I didn't get to art school. So I applied for a job um, as a trainee journalist on, um, on Jackie. Um, which my dad had just seen in a local paper. It was a tiny little advert. And I kind of, I was really excited by this. It completely took me in a different direction. I'd really wanted to be an illustrator. Um, but I'd had kind of, you know, this obsession with magazines. So to actually get a job there was brilliant. Mm. And they they used to take, take us on quite young because obviously it's a young, you know, a teenage girls magazine. So we were only, the staff were really only four or five years older than the readers, really. It's interesting because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up reading comics and um, I used to read TV comic and the Beano. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I had no artistic ability whatsoever, but I know a lot of, a lot of authors who, who did get into it that way through, through comics. And uh, I, I, did, mm -hmm. I wrote some of my, my I wrote some stories as, as comics, um, but I, I didn't have terribly good artistic ability, so I went went in more into into the prose side. Um, but yeah, interesting as you say, the staff were only sort of a little bit older than the intended readership, so you're very yeah. much in touch with the kind of fashions and the music and so on that they would would be into. Yeah, and I think we were kind of fans, and because I think in a way. The fact that Jackie was based in Dundee was partly why it was so successful because it was just sophisticated enough. It was like a big sister, but it wasn't that far removed from uh, the experiences of the readers themselves. You know, we were very much normal girls living in bedsits and flat shares, but all that at the time to a 13 year old would be really aspirational. You know, I had great dreams of being in a bedsit or a flat share with my friends and a you know, lamps all scattered with scarves and, you know, murals on the walls and all that kind of thing. And now, um, but it, it was a brilliant training, actually. And it's become, it, it's such an important part of, of a lot of people's lives, of women's lives now, isn't it? Of, of, of women uh, who now sort of look back on that as a, uh, as a great sort of nostalgic thing. And they've issued the sort of bumper um, revivalist uh, volumes, haven't they, of, of Jackie? Yeah. Uh, know their, yeah. for the market that they're, that they're appealing to. So um, yeah. yeah, very much, very much an important part of, of people's lives then. Um, and you, you worked, you went on to, you were in just 17 as well. You were the, the beauty yes. editor, fashion editor, is that right? Yeah, I was the beauty editor. And then I managed to, which was kind of a way of wangling in there because I really wanted to go to London after three years at Jackie. And that was the job that was vacant. So I sort of swatted up on, on blusher application and all that kind of thing. It was interviewed by David Hepworth, um, who had launched just 17 off the back of Smash Hits. 
And he, although he didn't become my editor there, he interviewed me. Um, he wasn't remotely interested in beauty. You know, I, I kind of swatted up on mascara and things like that. Um, expecting to be grilled on, you know, how would you tell a 14 year old how to do her makeup? Of course, he was just interested in my take on the magazine and what I could bring to it and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, but I managed to sidestep over to features when the deputy editor then, um, Ian Birch, sent me to interview Robert Smith from The Cure. Yes, the eyeliner tips from him, I'm sure, yeah. Well, it was, it was such a, a lucky kind of thing because as beauty editor, he said, I want you to go and ask him all about his makeup, which I did, but that managed to kind of like, you know, yes, shove me over to the features department, which was what I'd really wanted. And when... Um, when you're writing about things like fashion and beauty for, for young women and girls, do, do you feel this enormous sense of responsibility that, you know, you're contributing to the way they portray themselves to the world and, you know, the, the, the way that young girls are sort of expected to look by, by people and the way that, you know, young girls portray themselves to the outside world? you feel that this is something that, you know, you feel this sense of responsibility behind it, perhaps? Um, I really liked Just Seventeen's kind of ethos and their whole their whole way of communicating with teenagers was not to dictate how they dressed or looked. It was really, it was, you know, quite a radical magazine for its time. It was much more forthright in terms of the advice that was offered. It was a bit cocky. It had quite a sort of knowing kind of personality. So the readers, it was kind of we were on a level with the readers and it was all like we were all in, in a bit of a club together. So we were very supportive and very kind of um, encouraging readers to kind of be well-informed, to dress how they wanted, to not take any nonsense and to, you know, to be confident young women. So it didn't feel, I don't think there was any of that sort of uncomfortableness. I mean, yes, there was some stuff on, you know, how to condition your hair and how to, you know, deal with skin issues and all that kind of stuff, practical stuff. Well, that's, that's helpful. I mean, that's, that is yeah, and it, but it wasn't like, you know, you, I mean, it was, this is way before full on sort of Kardashian style contouring and all that came in, you know, it was the eighties and makeup at the time was kind of like playing. It was all, it was quite a fun time actually for style, makeup and hair and stuff. Yeah, you yeah. know, we're talking about banana rama yes, kind of, of course, era. Yeah. Of you know, remembering the French and Saunders sketch with the hair gel. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I mean, this is this is a you know a world which I knew nothing about, of course, as a teenage boy, because the magazines aimed at, at boys were, were you know very very different. Um, and I think I mean I did dip into smash hits, and that has that same kind of jokey sort of we're all yeah. together kind of tone, doesn't it? That that yes. friendly kind of bantering sort of tone. Um, yeah. And I know when um, you went sort of into, into other magazines as well, and my, um, the, the lady who's now my wife, who was my girlfriend in, in the 90s, when she lived together with a group of girls, and they often had copies of these magazines lying around, and we would do the, the quizzes for, as, a, as a jokey kind right. of... Right. And... Um, I, um, John probably written, actually. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> I mean, probably... more, more magazine was often lying around, and it was only years later I discovered that you were responsible for this notorious position of the fortnight. I was indeed. Which caused great, uh, great laughter. How, how did that come about? Well, that is, that is the complete high of my career, I think, to be honest. <laughs> that was when I was about... I must have been about 26, 27. Um, I was editor of Moore. So after just 17, I kind of hopped around a few different magazines and then went back to the company that published um, Just 17 Smash Hits because I loved them so much. It was the best place for me in London to, to work. Um, so I went back as editor of Moore, uh, which had been sort of stumbling along a little bit um, and then kind of settled into kind of a, as an older teenagers magazine leading into early 20s we said but you know you know everyone knew who read more really it was kind of mid-teens yeah, um so yeah that idea now position of the fortnight i must confess i semi-stole the idea from she magazine they had a columnist called dr delvin or devlin and he had a page Henry called Trump. function of the month um, and it was all a bit kind of, you know, doctory stuff, yeah. kind of gynecological. I and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be a laugh to do Position of the Fortnight? But my boss, uh, my publisher, 
wasn't keen and she said well you know this is going to last like three issues you know <laughs> and then it became one of the most most uh, uh, enjoyed features of, of the whole magazine yeah and it, I mean it literally rumbled on for years and years you know I suspect some of the positions were just flipped upside down and kind of reused you know Karma Sutra of magazines, yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, skipping ahead to, to more wholesome matters, um, though I think when I first became aware of your writings, because we were both writing about parenting, and I and I yeah. got uh, your your famous oh, book, yeah. Finger Years, um, because I was writing Dadlands at the same time, so yeah. we both doing parenting books, I think, when I realised you had a similar kind of sense of, of, of humour uh, as me, and we, we exchanged a few emails at, at the time. Um, yeah. And you have to have a sense of humour, don't you, really, to, to cope with bringing up small children. And uh, I think this is uh, why a lot of writers end up uh, trying to, to do a book about it, because it's almost sort of therapy, isn't it, really, putting it down on the page? It is, because, you know, even on the kind of darkest day, when you're trying to take them swimming and they're all climbing in the, in the lockers and you can't, somebody's saying, um, someone shouted, Mummy, why is that lady so cross? And it was, you know, it was me roaring at my children. I thought, well... At least I'm going to get a column out of this, you know. Yeah. So I would bash out a column. Is it, about you the, wrote a parenting column, didn't you? For the I parent. did. It was a kind of kind of my life sort of column for the um, Sunday Herald in Scotland, mm. and that went on for a few years. And that was kind of just family stuff. Um, it was a way of dumping it all, and a way of you know getting through it and cheering myself up. And I mean, you know, I loved the kind of primary school years of being a parent. But there were lots of, you know, disasters and um, it just, life just seemed really chaotic all the time. I'm sure you were the same. You had three to wrangle. I only had two. Yeah, so, um... yeah, twins and then um, twin boys and then three years later, a daughter. So we had three under four at one point and it was just chaotic, you know. I mean, I, I yeah, I would, with Dadlands was a was a sort of therapy for me and I, um, I hadn't thought of doing a parenting book, actually. And then... Um, yeah, I, I, because I started going into nonfiction and then I thought mm -hmm. yeah, I might as well do something about this. And it's it's proved remarkably durable. And I think yours has, too. And it's you know different successive generations have come back to it with sort of the digital uh, digital relaunches, which we which we uh, can enjoy as, as authors. Um, but uh, you, your your novels, um, I think, have. You know, not not just parenting, but women at, at sort of crisis points in their lives, don't they? I mean, thinking of examples of your your characters, you have Laura in Mum on the Run, who becomes a fitness fanatic, and and Kerry, who enters the world of, of dog uh, dog shows in, in Pedigree Mum, and um, Kate, who becomes an agony aunt in, in Mummy Said the F Word, and you know, all um, characters who've got this very clear sort of incident which kicks off their story which is really important for a novelist isn't it to have something which makes them uncomfortable takes them out of their comfort zone yeah I mean they all they all start from a different point of view mummy said the f word was the one where I felt like I'd, I'd found my feet in terms of style and voice there were there were four novels before that oh sorry three before that and they hadn't done great and I kind of don't really <laughs> I don't think I really knew I didn't really know my voice and what I was doing. I think I was trying to write, you know, a serious book because it's, you know, it's a book and it's got to be really intelligent and be kind of literary and subtle. And the big turning point, I know this, sorry, Dan, this has not answered your question at all. A friend said to me, you know, your books read like there's a big sigh over them. Why don't you write like you write for magazines, you know? And it was such a good, good piece of advice. So I abandoned a book I'd been writing, which wasn't really working out. Um, my then publisher weren't that happy with the way things were going. So I started afresh. Um, I, I wrote Mummy Said the F Word, started with a title, no story at all. Yeah. Um, it was, a, I was on the phone to a friend and her husband, their son had pulled out the plug on his computer. And in those days there was, things hadn't saved automatically, lost a huge document. And she said, oh God, you know, um, my the little boy just said, daddy said the F word. And I thought, oh, that's such a great book title, yeah. you know. Um, but the, the other books tend to start, I'll think, what, what's the kind of area I want to write in? Um, I mean, the one, the, this is the most recent one. Yeah. I just thought I really want to write because everybody is obsessed with dogs. You know, 
I really want to write a dog story. You know, that was kind of it. That's where it started. Um, the one before that, um, actually two before, the mum who got her life back, I'm just mentioning this because it's very easy to pinpoint. I wanted to write about being an empty nester because we were, and I thought there's so much humour to be had about going, you know, a single woman as an empty nester has got her life back, she can have a boyfriend, you know, there's no kind of judging from the young adult kids, but then one of the adult kids comes back and ruins everything. So they tend to start something kind of in my life really you know something I can kind of get my head around and then you have it appeals to the escapist in your reader doesn't it because you start with something in your life and then elaborate on that and go down a fictional route and it will it will appeal to yeah. that uh, that need in your in your readers to escape the humdrum and and be involved in something romantic different unusual yes a few hundred pages which is Oh, yeah, and it's really interesting you say that because the ones that have done the best sales-wise, one of them was um, the woman who upped and left. And I think that was because of the title. I think people just want, it's that kind of thing. Who hasn't at some point with a family just wanted to run off, run off and escape, even for a week or something, which is what my character in that book does. Yeah. And do you find that like, using um, extrapolating ideas from from your own life, um, do you do you dare let your family read your books? Because I, I I don't really. I mean, my my wife has, but my children haven't read my my books, and um, I feel a bit awkward about it. Well, um, my husband hasn't apart for many years because they're not his kind of book, mm. and I wouldn't really expect him to. Um, my daughter, actually, I, I wrote this book, finished this one in lockdown, mm. and I've since written another one in lockdown. And I have to say, I found it really difficult. I found it hard to focus. I don't know if you found the same. Everybody was home. We're in a flat. At one point, we had five people living here. It was really difficult. So actually, my daughter read that because she proofread it for me before I sent it off to my editor because I just felt I need someone to look at this I really my head is not really working the way it should so my daughter read that but from a kind of and she did a brilliant job at proofreading and then one of my sons Sam read the one I've just finished proofread that for me and I'd stolen a little bit of his life in it but I'd done it kind of unselfconsciously so he was, he put a few margin notes like, yeah, mum, you know, which I kind of thought, oh, is that a bit insensitive of me? Because I kind of do it without thinking, thinking no one's going to read it, you know. And, and by the time it's gone through the filter of me writing it and rewriting it and editing, nothing's recognisable anyway, you know. Yeah, it is, it's difficult to do. I mean, I, um, I just, I mean, I just started, as you know, writing for, for young people and teenagers, but mine are more kind yeah. of supernatural exotic sort of things so they don't use anything from from everyday life um but there's something i mean we should mention as well the sort of elephant in the room which is never mind the f word there's the c word chiclet you know yeah that that phrase that was all, always used probably about a decade or more old now and uh, women's books were lumped under this sort of generic term of, of chiclet and I remember when I first did one of these interviews with uh, Susan Elliott Wright who's uh, the first writer I interviewed here and we, we were talking on International Women's Day and we talked about the ways in which women's books are marketed as opposed to the ways in which men are marketed and and what what do you think about this is, is there something is there a particular kind of um, attitude that publishers have towards women and the way in which women's books should be marketed and lump you in as chiclet and is that something you want to embrace or reject or or what well yeah i mean chiclet has been around i think it's been around really since bridget jones and isn't that 20 i think that might be 20 years actually or even 25 yeah, or, yeah. yeah it was 97 know, wasn't it bridget jones 96 97 so yeah right. so and then there was a whole rash of of that kind of book wasn't there um i don't i don't really i don't I've got mixed feelings about it. I think chiclet, I don't think I write chiclet because I think it's just in terms of its age, it's kind of grown up. It's it's maybe chiclet readers that have come up with me. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, people call it mumlet sometimes um, or momcom, which, <laughs> which actually a Facebook friend of mine 
made up. I actually quite like it because mm. they're rom-coms really is what I write. I tend to think of them as romantic comedies. Um, they are targeted at a female audience. Um, the covers tend to be very kind of jolly and grabby and bright colours and fun. Um, I don't have a problem with that because it's the reality of it. I mean, there's occasionally guys read my books, but it, it is quite rare, you know. I mean, there isn't, um, really, there isn't really lad lit, although there is in a sense that there's people like Mike Gale and Nick Hornby, but they're not quite seeing the same kind of, it's not such a big thing, is it? It was a lad no. lit like a thing we've got to, we've got to invent because chick lit exists. So there has to be a, a female a yeah. version of the, of the female thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, Mark, yeah. Mark, I totally get that. Yeah, that's... Um, rom -com. I mean, yeah, wi women's fiction as it's, as you know it's called as well I mean it, it can seem a bit disparaging um I, I see mine as kind of either rom-com or just commercial fiction commercial women's fiction I mean, they're mostly sold in supermarkets um you know they jump out hopefully jump out on the shelves at Tesco and Sainsbury's and stuff so you know yeah I think your books are very well marketed I mean they certainly know their market they've got lovely bright covers really eye-catching covers and mm -hmm. slightly sort of cartoony which I think is good because then you're not fixed on what the the physical image of the character is meant to be and you can you can sort of put your own idea of, of them on onto that which, which is good mm -hmm. um so yeah um that's that's an interesting question. I think it's it's one that people will always come back to, the way in which men are marketed as opposed to the way in which, which women are marketed. And I think there's the whole sort of women's fiction thing is is always mm -hmm. like a big section in, in in bookshops, whereas men's fiction isn't, is it? It's just fiction. It's just exactly. crime or it's yes. horror or it's sci-fi or whatever. Um, would you would you write something that wasn't a contemporary novel? Um, would you write something historical or futuristic, do you think? Or? Historical doesn't really appeal to me. I would quite like to stretch myself, I have to say. Um, I really like, every time I kind of toy with trying something else, I always veer back to what I'm really comfortable with, which is comedy and relationships and friendships and just the detail of ordinary life is what I really love to write about. But I've got a bit of a burning thing to try something a bit darker. Um, but I think what I'd have to do is just carve out some time and try it as a little bit of a side project because my books are under contract. I was doing two a year for a while and I found I just couldn't hack that. So I've gone back down to one a year again, which at the moment with lockdown and everything we've been dealing with, feels like enough actually at the moment. Um, so I would like to try other things. Um, but yeah, it's that carving out a bit of time I really don't want to stop doing you know what my readers kind of expect and and the books that I still do enjoy writing I've seen it would be lovely to have more time to write all kinds of things wouldn't it yeah, absolutely I mean I've seen uh, people who were sort of pigeonholed as women's writers starting to veer in, into crime and thinking of people like um, Adele Parks and Lynn Barrett yeah. who started doing sort of hard-hitting crime novels um, with you know, that very different sort of cover um, so that's obviously the the thing now, isn't it? That's, that's going to sell. Um, but yes, yeah, yeah. totally different market. Yeah, it is. Uh, Lisa Jewell's kind of stepped over, hasn't she? I love her thrillers. I think they're absolutely brilliant. But I used to really like her kind of romantic, kind of flat sharing type novels. Mm -hmm. Her early books it's, were lovely. It's good to evolve with your readership, and yeah. I mean, you've reinvented yourself a couple of times as well, haven't you? Some sort of little side projects that you've done. Because let's talk about your your aliases that you had. Um, let's, let's talk about Fiona Foden first of all, who was your your young adult alias. Where did where did that come from? Um, that came about because my daughter was right at that point, at around sort of eleven, twelve, of reading. Um, first, you know, those little paperback kind of books about real life and um, kind of recognisable characters in the kind of Jacqueline Wilson sort of, you know, arena. And we were talking about books a lot together and I would read her books and I was really enjoying reading children's and young adult fiction at the time. Um, and I just thought I'd really like to have a go at this. Um, I was coming to the end of my time with my previous publisher for adult books, it felt like something new to try. So I sort of dabbled in that and did four of those with uh, for Scholastic. Um, so they were, they were shortish novels, about half the size of an adult novel, about 50,000 words. Really enjoyed doing them. 
and you I want don't to I could do it again no I mean you chose a different name to keep them separate from your Fiona Gibson books so yeah. it's sort of an open secret that that, that is you yes. um, and the same with Ellen Berry as well who is your other alias I mean again it's no secret that that is your alias because you've got a link on your website yeah. to the Ellen Berry books and I suppose they're seen as more are they more more kind of heartwarming more kind of romantic more less sort they of a, uh, um, you know sort of um, less sort of family relationship driven stuff and crisis driven they're more kind of friendly warm-hearted romantic feel yeah novels. exactly yeah and I kind of I liked the idea of the setting tying the stories together mm. as it turned out there were bigger gaps between the books than I'd originally planned I didn't quite manage to hit deadlines as I'd hoped but I did really like writing a series but I learned a lot from it I hadn't really plotted the three books and I think if I did a series again they would all be plotted right. It would, I'd go in with the whole, I kind of winged it a bit, to be honest, but I did really enjoy writing them. And it was not, not having to play it quite so hard for laughs was actually quite liberating. It was nice. It was more a sort of gentle experience writing them. It's something I should do. I mean, I, I became Dan Roberts for a couple of my non-fiction books, but I, I, I've not reused Dan Roberts for, for anything else. So I'm, I may well mm -hmm. do at some point in the future. I, I think it's a good idea to separate out your, your adult and your children's and different genres. And I, I haven't done that so much. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe something for, for the future. Um, so just a little bit, Fiona, about your, um, about your writing routine. I mean, do you have a fixed place where you have to work? Do you have a, a fixed number of words per day or do you let it come more organically or how do you go about it um oh i i am quite i find it quite easy to kind of just get on with it and write all day i treat it very much like a full-time job um i like to get out in the morning and walk the dog and then it's kind of down to business mm -hmm. Um, I don't mind working at home all the time and obviously we've all had to haven't we the past year and a, a bit but I did used to really like working in cafes and libraries. I prefer actually working out of the house. Um, so I used to do that about half of the time. Now, I, because of home working husband and various adult kids coming back at various times, I've now ended up working in the bedroom, which is all right. I, I'm one of these people that can kind of work anywhere. You know, I'm really not particular. As long as I haven't got a load of distractions, I always have music on and head right. with headphones, always, always. Um, yeah. I love writing on trains. Um, I, I really envy people who can do that because I, I really can't. I can't write with people around me in a cafe. I can't, I certainly can't work really? on a train because I'd be worried that, you know, in, in normal sort of non-pandemic times, there'd be somebody peering over your shoulder. Oh, what's that, <laughs> mate? You know, I would hate that. So I, I have to work. I know a lot of people are like me have to work in a fixed place desk at an office and lots of people are like you can go out and about yeah. and it's good that we have our our different yeah. practices whatever works for you has to work doesn't it really yes I think I think what I need what I've I've over the years because I've been doing this for a long time now I started writing books I think it was about 17 or 18 years ago so I found out ways of I have to try and make it enjoyable for myself because we, you know what it's like. It can be lonely and it can actually be quite drab and you can feel very isolated. And to keep yourself stimulated and inspired can be quite a challenge. So things like, you know, I, I'm much better now realizing that I need a break, for instance, and I need to get out and move, you know, walk. You know, a dog is, a dog is brilliant for this actually. Or go for a run or talk to somebody, you know, um, yeah. And then, of course, that gives you more material for books because you end up writing does. a book about, yeah. about dogs or about someone who takes up running. For, uh, yes, <laughs> and I do, and I do have daily targets. I t I try and write two thousand words a day. Once I'm in the swing, yeah, um, yeah. fifteen hundred is okay. I think that's um, impressive, actually, because I I think I think a thousand is is a is a you know is always always seem to be like a decent target. But if you can do double that, that's 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 well. Very I've got a terrible habit of um, of not hitting my, you know, of, of, how do I explain this, of setting my goals too high and then being cross with myself because, you know, I haven't written 10,000 words in a week, say, which is a lot. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I, I ended up writing faster and faster to meet deadlines when I had two different books to do in a year. And 
what I've found is they've needed quite a big edit. So I don't really plan very much. I, t I jump in, I think too early actually, with a bit of a skeleton of an idea. So this book, I'm just about to start one. I'm actually really going to plan it out, which means I can sit in the garden with a notebook. Yeah. You know. This is again something else that I've never been able to do. I and mean, I, I have, I think, one book, The Cut, I actually sat down and planned it with highlighter and alternating scenes and so on. And that was alien to my way of thinking. And I mm -hmm. just go in and write. And this is why I've, I've done some, some teaching of writing and I find it quite hard to do because I feel like I'm imposing my own way of writing on people. And yeah. so I would like to write sort of by the seat of the pants. And some people like to plan really, really carefully. And uh, yeah, it's, I feel like I can't impose you know, my way of doing it on, on someone else. But uh, it's some, yeah, it's something I, I, I can't believe I still wrestle with this because I should now have the perfect recipe on how to write a book. A lot of Every people say time. that. Yeah, a lot of people say yeah. that. People who've been writing like we have for 20, 25 years will yeah. absolutely say, I feel I'm still a beginner. I'm still learning. I don't know how to do this yet. Uh, and I think that's quite normal. <laughs> And every new book is going to be the perfectly executed book, isn't it? I'm going to have no stress. I'm not going to be pacing the streets, muttering to myself this time. It's going to be delivered on time, if not early. You know, it always ends up completely harem scare and panic writing at two in the morning. Always. Yep, totally, totally. And I think some of us thrive on that pressure and uh, it's, it's good, good to have it. So, yeah. Um, uh, this is the Blythe Tapes on my YouTube channel. I've been talking to Fiona Gibson today, who is a, a journalist and acclaimed novelist, and we've talked about lots and lots of different things. Um, and uh, if you want to find out more about Fiona, you can go to her website, which is fionagibson.com. Uh, her latest book is The Dog Share, and you're working on something new. Tell us what you're working on, if you can give us anything, any idea about that, Fiona. What can you tell us? About the new um, I have, I'm literally just starting a bit of an idea. Um, my, the book that I've just finished is about kind of life post redundancy sort of and adult dating online dating at 50 so that's the one i've just finished it doesn't have a title yet because my my suggested titles are never chosen so we have to go through that big debate yet yeah. the one i'm just starting i think i'd like to write about a stepmom but i'm kind of just teasing out the ideas i'll see what that throws up Endless ideas there. So, um, yeah, Fiona, thank you very much for your time. I think this has been really informative for a lot, a lot of people. Very enjoyable to talk to you. Uh, thanks very much for your time today and for coming along and uh, being interviewed on the Blight Tapes. Great. Thanks a lot for asking me. It was, it was great to talk to you.